What is dissent? How would you define that? So I think I would define dissent as the courage to stand up against the majority. It's pretty remarkable if you think about it, going back to the 18th century, that Benjamin Franklin and George Washington, James Madison, and all of the leading figures of the American Revolution, almost to a one, lined up behind the Constitution. And yet still, there was this massive outpouring of dissent. And a lot of it came from backcountry farmers or artisans who had the audacity to think that they knew just as well as George Washington how their government ought to serve their interest. It's the same audacity that the revolutionaries had when they announced they knew as well as the king in England how to govern themselves. So from a distance, that's very admirable. When you're in the moment, I imagine it's very daunting and you don't know what price you're going to pay for standing up against the government, against the majority, against popular opinion. Um, so to me, dissent is an act of civic mindedness and of courage. This is American Dissent a podcast from With Good Reason and James Madison's Montpelier about pushing back in the pursuit of a better America. I'm Kelly Libby. The U.S. Constitution is the oldest written constitution still in use today. It's a single document that lays out a framework for how our country is governed. It's fairly simple and short and flexible. But when it was proposed, it was considered a radical design for a government. Lori Glover is a professor of history at St. Louis University, and she wrote a book called The Fate of the Revolution about the decision in Virginia to accept or reject this new constitution in 1788. Okay, so let's start there. Let's start in 1788. What's going on at that time? So uh, the country is fractured, deep division, and mutual contempt on two sides of an existential question, and that is, will the country adopt a new form of government or reject that? And the stakes were extraordinarily high because people at the time, both those on the side of supporting the Constitution and those who were opposed to supporting the Constitution, believed that nothing less than the future of the American Republic, of an independent America, was at stake. So we think about the Constitution as a settled fact. But in doing that, we forget that there was almost a year-long, a little over a year-long process of the whole country debating about whether or not that was an advisable transformation to make. There was general consensus in the spring of 1787 that the Articles of Confederation were flawed and in need of change. The government, the Confederation Congress, reluctantly agreed to sanction a meeting uh, in Philadelphia in the summer of 87 that would revise the Articles of Confederation. They were very explicit about the charge of the Philadelphia Convention, which was to revise the Articles of Confederation. And what are the Articles of Confederation? The first government under which the United States operated. They wanted a decentralized government where power was held closer to the locale. What happened with the Articles of Confederation, though, is they went too far in that direction. And the authority of the Articles of Confederation were so decentralized as to render the government ineffective, even failing, in some fundamental needs of the United States. So under the Articles of Confederation, the states had more power? The Articles of Confederation, Federation started with um, a statement about the sovereignty of the states. So when people in the 18th century said the United States, they didn't say the United States is 
the way we do today. They said the United States are, so that each state was sovereign. There was a confederated Congress that had representatives from each of the states. There was no central judiciary. There was no permanent seat of government, nothing like Washington, D.C. There was no chief executive. The men who served in the Confederation Congress were elected to annual terms and had very strict term limits. So you could not serve more than three years without having to return back home, move out of office, and have someone else take that spot. And so then how is the Constitution then proposed? So despite the express charge that the meeting in Philadelphia was to revise the Articles of Confederation, the men who met, they almost immediately abandoned that charge and instead, under the guidance of James Madison, set about creating a fundamentally different kind of government than existed under the Articles of Confederation. And they did this in secrecy. They pledged that no one would talk to anyone outside. No one would write about their proceedings to their wives or their relatives or their friends back home. They would work in absolute secrecy, and only once they had agreed to their proposal would they unveil it to their government and the citizens of the various states. Why did they do it in secrecy? So the principal architects of the Constitutional Convention, and James Madison in particular, believed that if there were too many outside influences, that the delegates in Philadelphia would never be able to compromise on key elements of the design of the government. So if every day what they were doing was reported in the newspapers in Philadelphia, if every day people wrote back to Virginia and Massachusetts and Georgia and North Carolina about what was going on, they would hear from their wives and their friends and their neighbors um, about what should be done that would put political pressure on them to not compromise. Who were the major players in Virginia? So the major players in Virginia during the Philadelphia meeting were James Madison, who was, again, the principal architect of the Constitution, and George Washington, who presided over what became known as the Constitutional Convention. Two other key players in the ratification debate after the Philadelphia meeting were George Mason, who was a neighbor and had been a friend of George Washington, and Patrick Henry, who was the most politically powerful man in Virginia. George Mason became one of the three men who refused to sign the Constitution. Another powerful Virginian, Edmund Randolph, and he was the governor of Virginia, and he also refused to sign. Why were there people who were opposed to the Constitution? So many people were opposed to the Constitution because it created a government that on the surface, looked an awful lot like the English government that the colonists had rebelled against just a decade before. It created a distant, centralized government. There was a powerful chief executive. Uh, there was a standing army, and everybody in the 18th century understood that a standing army would undermine a free society and threaten citizens' rights. There were no term limits for anyone who served in the proposed federal government, and there were no guaranteed rights of individuals and of states. And most states, in their state constitution, they had bills of rights. The idea of a bill of rights was actually born in Virginia. George Mason was the architect of the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which became a model for the Declaration of Independence, and it was replicated in many other states. So was there then a response to those criticisms? Absolutely. Patrick Henry and George Mason, they believed that the design of the government under the Constitution was the opposite of what the revolution had been all about. On the other side, people like James Madison and George Washington believed that the Constitution was the only way to save the American Republic, that it was the fulfillment of the principles of the American Revolution. 
To them, it looked like the country would either cave in on itself from civil disorder or because it was so weak, it might be invaded by a European power. And so on both sides, the leading spokespeople thought if the other side won, it would be the end of their most treasured rights and the end of the republic the end of the experiment in representative democracy in the United States. At the time, was slavery a concern for the people who were thinking about and drafting this constitution? Uh, slavery was very much a concern and very much of concern throughout the early United States. It was clear to almost everyone that Slavery could not be reconciled to the ideals that were announced in the revolution. The idea that every person has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that the King of England is no better than a farmer in North America, that citizens can and should govern themselves. There was just no way to reconcile the continuation of slavery while you espouse those ideals. And slaveholders like Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson and George Mason wrote about that. They wrote about the hypocrisy of remaining slaveholders in what was supposed to be a free republic. However, their desire for wealth and racial power got the better of their principles. When they met in Philadelphia, the delegates were very intentional about never putting the word slave in the Constitution because they knew that the word slave would upset people in the future. At the same time, The Southern uh, delegates in particular to the Constitutional Convention wanted to make sure that the federal government did not end slavery. And so slavery is, in fact, protected in three different places of the Constitution. But they never use the word slave. They use words, phrases like all other persons. So what are those three instances? The Constitution included a fugitive slave law which is if slaves from a slaveholding locale ran to another, they could be retrieved. The Constitution also allowed for the international slave trade to continue for 20 years after ratification. That was written into the Constitution as well. And then probably most importantly for the delegates and for the for future controversies that emerged in the United States, For both purposes of taxation and representation, the Constitution counted each slave as three-fifths of a person. So that's called the three-fifths clause now. When they were trying to calculate how many representatives each state would have in the Congress, Southern slaveholders wanted to count their slaves because they knew that that would give them more representatives. So there was a compromise about how to count enslaved people, and the result was they would count as three-fifths of a person. And so what did the Constitution consist of? So the new Constitution is is very specific, uh, and it's very practical. It's not very long. It creates a central judiciary, it creates an executive branch, it creates a legislative branch, it defines the authorities that each of those branches of government have, um, and the processes by which people who run those parts of the government will be selected. And then what are the Bill of Rights? What is the distinction between the Bill of Rights and the Constitution? So today, we think about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights as one single thing, but that's simply not true. The Constitution was ratified in the late summer of 1788. The opponents of ratification then submitted to the new government changes that they wanted made in the Constitution. 
But the Bill of Rights was not created until after the first Congress. It was a very long, very divisive process. And two of the 12 amendments or changes to the Constitution that were proposed out of the first Congress failed. Today, we think about the First Amendment as somehow sacred. What we forget is it's only the first in a list of 10 because two others, the original first and second proposed, fail to be ratified by the states. The other thing that people forget about the Bill of Rights is that the rights they treasure the most were born out of a grassroots movement by the sharpest critics of the Constitution to change it even as it was beginning. So there was dissent against the Constitution. And out of that dissent comes this movement to change the Constitution. And those parts that got changed by the dissenters are the Bill of Rights. And so what is the legacy of that for us today? So I think there's a really powerful legacy of dissent that people fundamentally disagreed about the implications of what the Constitution said, what it might mean for people's day-to-day lives, what it might mean for how they paid taxes or whether they could be free of a military occupation. We see the founding fathers in velvet knee breeches, in beautiful legislative halls, and we think that they created the government through consensus, through reasoned debate, that it was all very tranquil, and we've somehow lost what they had, that we've descended into partisanship that people dissent too much and disagree too stridently. In truth, they were as divided as we are today. There were lots of disagreements, lots of dissent about the creation of the Constitution and of the Bill of Rights at the foundation of our country. Um, What did that dissent look like? So in the Virginia Ratification Convention, James Madison was opposed by Patrick Henry and George Mason. They lost the final vote. They lost 89 to 79, so that five votes swung the other direction would have meant that Virginia didn't accept the Constitution. Virginia was the largest and the most important state in the United States, and if Virginia hadn't accepted the Constitution, then the Constitution would have failed. Patrick Henry and George Mason were not convinced by James Madison's arguments that everything would be okay under the Constitution, that it was a fulfillment of the revolution, uh, that liberty could thrive under the federal government. Patrick Henry said that he would continue to work as hard as he could to make sure that the Constitution was changed to protect citizens' liberty, but he, he would do that as a peaceful citizen. George Mason took a different course. He called a meeting of the Anti-Federalist. Exactly what he said is lost in the historical record, but he apparently made some kind of call to civil unrest. And Even the most strident other anti-federalists, including Patrick Henry, rejected Mason's appeal. They want to work within the bounds of the law, not extra-legally, to continue to dissent from the majority. And how did that then affect the lives of any of them, if at all? So the aftermath of the Uh, Virginia Ratification Convention was very damaging to George Mason's public reputation. He never again served in any elective office. Patrick Henry remained the most politically powerful man in Virginia, even though he had lost this critical debate. And he continued to shape the federal government from within the Virginia General Assembly. So the first thing he did was he denied James Madison a seat in the Senate. At the time, senators were chosen by state legislatures. 
And when James Madison's name was suggested as a senator, Patrick Henry insisted he be rejected because James Madison had said there was no need for a Bill of Rights. He also gerrymandered the first districts in Virginia. I mean, that, that term doesn't get used until later, but that's basically what he does. He, did, he draws the lines for the districts for the House of Representatives so that they disadvantage James Madison. And then Patrick Henry convinces James Monroe to run against James Madison for the Congress. So what James Madison has to do in the course of campaigning for a congressional seat in the government that he had helped to design, he had to pivot and make a political campaign pledge that if he were elected, he would support a Bill of Rights. And he did. Is there still in existence a tension between the government that the Constitution formed and the Bill of Rights? So the the meaning of the Bill of Rights has changed over time, but there's certainly uh, tensions between individual rights and governmental authority. People in the 18th century call that divide liberty and power. So how much individual liberty were you willing to give up so that there could be power to create social stability, that there could be power to create, you know, economic stability? On the other hand, how much power were you willing to tolerate before it threatened individual liberty? And I think that tension between liberty and power and the authority of the government versus the uh, autonomy of an individual was at the heart of the tension over the Constitution. And I think that's the central political struggle in our civic life today. Were Patrick Henry and James Madison of different generations? Yeah, Patrick Henry uh, was quite a bit older than James Madison. James Madison was quite young. I think he was 32 when he created the design for the Constitution and 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 basically led the conversations in Philadelphia. Patrick Henry, by that time, I think he had 16 children. Yeah, I just, I asked that question because so many young people today are doing things like walking out of their school in protest um, or just getting involved in politics in general. And I'm hearing that our government was formed by young people. Like there were people in their 20s and 30s who were <laughs> making decisions. That's right. But to be sure, all of the people who had a civic identity and could participate uh, in electoral politics in the 18th century were property-owning white men. So we have a lot um, in common in some ways with the 18th century in terms of partisan press, political culture, deep cultural divisions. But one way in which we are profoundly, fundamentally different is the way we have reimagined we the people. And that's how the Constitution starts, we the people. And we the people in the late 18th century was a much narrower group than it is today. So I see the young people at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School uh, or the young people in my hometown of St. Louis in the Black Lives Matter movement. And I think in some ways they are fulfilling the high-minded ideals um, and uh, political activism that was born at the founding of our country. And I also think how different they are from the people who were allowed to have a voice in the 18th century and how much we have grown and changed as a country. American Descent is a production of With Good Reason at Virginia Humanities and James Madison's Montpelier. Our artwork is by Carson McNamara, and our music is by Breakmaster Cylinder. Special thanks to Joe Stoltz at the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington. I'm Kelly Libby. Thanks for listening. 